When you think of military equipment, you might think of anything from tanks to socks, battleships to bandages, but one thing that doesn't typically come to mind is candy. But candy and soldiers have a long history together. Candy has changed the military. Wars have changed candy, and military candy has changed culture. Shoot, candy might even have made a difference in battle. It is history that deserves to be remembered. There's an old adage that an army travels on its stomach. While often attributed to Napoleon, according to the website Quote Investigator, the phrase might instead have originated with Frederick the Great, who died in 1786, but was quoted in an 1858 book by historian Thomas Carlyle with the line, The army, like a serpent, goes on its belly. The point, of course, is that supply is a critical part of military success, or as Napoleon was quoted as saying, there is no subordination with empty stomachs. But the concept of military supply, of course, predates both Napoleon and Frederick the Great. The website of the History Channel quotes Thomas R. Martin, a professor of the classics at the College of the Holy Cross, that ancient sources say that Roman soldiers were given a ration of a pound of meat daily. And thus, Martin says, for an army, you have to kill 120 sheep a day just for the meat ration, or 60 hogs. Martin notes that archaeological evidence shows that Roman armies hunted almost everything that was available, although he adds that the most important source of calories were carbohydrates, barley or wheat. Noticeably missing, however, from the reported menus of ancient armies is sweets, although sources suggest that the relatively well-fed Ottoman Janissaries had a ration of honey. Despite the energy density and morale effects of sweets, they found little place among military rations. For example, in June 1775, when the Massachusetts Provincial Council set the daily allowance of rations for its troops in Boston, the ration included beef, butter, bread, milk, beer, and beans, but no sweets. However, there are records that soldiers were issued or purchased from sutlers chocolate during the Revolution, although a coarse form that would have had to have been boiled as a drink, often mixed with wine. The military website We Are the Mighty notes that undoubtedly it was highly prized because of the high caffeine and sugar content. Sweets were also ignored in rations during the Napoleonic era. Napoleon, who, despite his comments about subordination, was not always brilliant at feeding his troops, wrote in his orders to the Grand Army that rations should include soup, boiled beef, a roasted joint, and some vegetables, but added, no dessert. It is somewhat ironic, then, that the website Russia Beyond notes on the 100th anniversary of Napoleon's defeat in his 1812 campaign in Russia, Russian merchants commemorated the event by selling Napoleon-shaped chocolates and a new pastry that appeared in the form of Napoleon's hat, which was layered with cream and cut into triangles. The British rations when fighting against Napoleon were also devoid of sweets, with the website of the reenacted group 2nd Battalion, 95th Rifles, listing a ration during the time of one and a half pounds bread or flour, or one pound of ship's biscuit, one pound of beef or one half pound of pork, one quarter pint dried peas, one ounce cheese or butter, one ounce rice. While hot chocolate drink was all the rage at home in England, the military rations were a tad more potent, being five pints small beer or one pint wine or one half pint spirits. However, candy was coming into its own in military rations by the time of the U.S. Civil War. For example, while the common confection called the jelly bean might have evolved from a jelly candy called Turkish Delight that dates back at least to pre-biblical times, the jelly bean, the website of manufacturer Jelly Bean Notes, required also a shell coating called panning, invented in the 17th century to make a confection called Jordan Almonds. The two were not combined, however, until 1861, and their first use had to do with the U.S. Civil War. Jelly Belly continues, The earliest known appearance of a jelly bean is an 1861 advertisement for William Shraft of Boston that promoted the sending of jelly beans to soldiers in the Union Army during the Civil War. Being from Boston, the new candy would have far more favored the Union than the Confederacy. Still, soldiers on both sides would have enjoyed sweets. The historic candy maker True Treats notes that Civil War soldiers received food, including sweets and sugars, from numerous places. The government, packages from home, groups and associations, and sutlers, disreputable merchants who followed the troops, selling overpriced, often hard-to-find foods. Still, the Union would have had a candy advantage, as New England had become, at the time of the Civil War, what has been described as the birthplace of the commercial candy industry. This is largely due to the innovation of Boston confectioner Oliver Chase, who in the 1850s had invented both a lozenge cutter and a machine for pulverizing sugar that created a simple candy made of sugar and gelatin and cut into wafers. At the time, the candy was called Hub Wafers, and anecdotes suggest they were popular among Union Army troops. The website War History Online writes, The wafers were an ideal food to give to an army, as they were small, easy to transport, tough, and didn't degrade like other foods. Their sweet taste would have certainly given troops a small mental boost 
during wartime. After a merger in 1901, the Chase Candy Company changed its name to the New England Candy Company, thus the name by which hub wafers are still produced today, Necco Wafers. Necco Wafers are particularly valuable for militaries because they travel well, remain good in all sorts of weather. They're included in U.S. military rations in the Second World War, when part of the Necco factory was given over to wartime production. When Admiral Richard Byrd led the United States Antarctic Service Expedition in 1939 and 40, he took with him enough Necco wafers to provide one pound per week per person for the entire two-year expedition. By the time the U.S. entered the Great War, the U.S. candy industry was well established, and yet the demand by troops for candy affected the industry greatly. Goldenberg Peanut Chews, a concoction of peanuts and molasses covered in chocolate, were created for military rations, providing a high-energy, high-protein ration. The Clark Bar, with a crispy peanut butter and spun taffy core covered in chocolate, was also developed for troops overseas. Both were individually wrapped, uncommon for a time when most candy was still sold from candy stores, for ease of transportation and distribution to troops. Both found success with returning troops who had developed a taste for them overseas, and both are still sold today. The YMCA made an agreement to operate post exchanges during the war. When supplying troops in Europe, they found both importing candy from the United States and buying it from French sources was prohibitively expensive, and so built candy manufacturing facilities in Europe to make candy to sell to U.S. troops. Lara Vogt, a curator at the National World War I Museum, said in the Washington Post this year that the YMCA factories in Europe had a monthly capacity of 20 million tablets or bars to help satiate the sweet tooth of the American doughboys. The sugar and caffeine were found to improve both energy and morale, and chocolate was made part of the ration, with soldiers being issued a half pound of candy for 10 days. When those soldiers came home, their taste for candy helped to spur a growth of industry that essentially established the candy, and especially candy bar culture, in the United States today. Many of the most popular brands of candy bars, Milky Way, Snickers, O. Henry, Mars Bars, Babe Ruth, and Three Musketeers were invented in the candy boom between the wars. The Washington Post suggests that the Great War and the taste for candy created by it was the reason that the tradition of giving candy treats on Halloween developed in the United States. And it was not just the U.S. The British military recognized candy as a way to boost mood that was less troublesome than alcohol, and chocolate was given to improve troop morale. The importance of candy in military rations, providing calories, energy, and boosting morale was recognized fully in the Second World War. The small candy-coated M&M was included in small cardboard rolls in sea rations and produced under exclusive contract for the military during the war. Once again, the taste soldiers got for the candy resulted in a popular product after the war. The Hershey Company was asked to develop special military chocolate, while the standard K ration included a bar of standard Hershey sweet chocolate. In 1935, Hershey developed a special chocolate bar called the D ration. The idea of the ration was to provide the highest amount of calories in the smallest possible package. The ration was to be usable under any climatic conditions and should be palatable enough for continued use. The D ration was just one four-ounce chocolate bar, with the Army demand being a weight of four ounces, high in food energy value, able to withstand high temperatures, and taste a little better than a boiled potato. The Army didn't want a candy bar that tasted too good because they did not want soldiers eating the emergency rations in non-emergency situations. Hershey also created a special bar for tropical zones that was better tasting but still able to withstand higher temperatures. The venerable Necco wafer, among others, was also produced for the military in large numbers during the war. The U.S. was not the only nation to grasp the value of calorie-dense candies. German rations included a number of different candies, from lemon candies intended to help the soldier withstand cold climates, to mints and chocolate bars, which were produced for the German Air Force and often traded with other service branches. The German recognition of the morale and health effects of candy, however, most showed in their Zustaffer Fleetflug für Fontkampfer, or supplemental rations for frontline soldiers, and please don't worry about my pronunciation. This special ration was essentially four kinds of candy, a box of cookies, and some cigarettes, and was given to troops preparing for or returning from a major battle. But of all the stories of candy and combat troops, one stands out. In November 1950, some 30,000 United Nations troops, mostly Marines of the U.S. 1st Division along with some Army troops, British commandos, and South Korean forces, were attacked by an estimated 120,000 Chinese troops around Korea's Chosin Reservoir. The Battle of Chosin Reservoir was desperate, with the Chinese 9th Army ordered to eliminate the U.N. force. Unwilling to surrender, the force was required to break through Chinese encirclement to reach the coast, something to which General Oliver Prince Smith, in command of the 1st Marines, famously said, Retreat, hell! We're not retreating! We're just advancing 
in a different direction. The Battle of Chosen Reservoir was known not just for being a particularly violent battle, but for the rugged terrain and harsh weather conditions, with nighttime temperatures as low as 35 degrees below zero Fahrenheit, earning the nickname Frozen Chosen. Supplies froze and equipment malfunctioned. The UN force did, however, a substantial air support, and the U.S. Air Force Far East Combat Cargo Command in Japan was able to airdrop 250 tons of supplies per day to resupply the trapped United Nations forces. And in the middle of that battle came the Tootsie Roll. The chocolate-flavored taffy-like candy called Tootsie Roll, named after the confection inventor Leo Hirschfeld's daughter, had been manufactured since 1907, and the Marines were about to get a lot of them. Retired Marine Lieutenant Colonel Andy Trainer explains in a video by the Museum of the United States Marine Corps, when they were radioing for information, supplies, or giving status back and forth from their command headquarters, they used code words to indicate different things. In this case, the code word for 60 millimeter mortar ammunition is Tootsie Roll. Battle survivor Bob Weishan explained in the St. Louis Post-Dispatch in 2001 how the code name went awry. Instead of radioing for additional ammunition, the men used the words Tootsie Roll, hoping the Air Force would understand what they meant. The Air Force didn't get it. They actually airshipped us Tootsie Rolls. You can imagine that the Marines were rather surprised to open boxes of chocolate taffy rather than mortar rounds, but the Tootsie Rolls ended up being a blessing. The Marines' sea rations were frozen. Washington continues, We had nothing to eat but Tootsie Rolls. They were hard because it was so cold, but if you put them in your pocket, your body heat would keep them pliable. If it hadn't been for Tootsie Rolls, many of us would not have made it. Fellow Marine Fred Wall said, We were in a terrible shape when it came to food. We had frozen fruit salad. The bread the airlifted was crumbled when it hit the ground. Water in canteens was frozen. But the Tootsie Rolls were a life-sustaining food. You could put it in your mouth and it would get soft. It gave us sustenance, life, and energy. Marine Wayne Queen was quoted in the Charlotte Observer in 2012. It was 35 below. Our food was frozen. We were on our own and low on ammo. Cases of Tootsie Rolls had been dropped by parachute, and the infantry had them in their pockets. They were frozen, but you could put them in your mouth to thaw, and they would give you energy. It was all we had to eat. Those Tootsie Rolls literally saved my life. In addition to providing critical energy, the Marines found that Tootsie Rolls would turn into a sort of putty when warmed and then quickly freeze again, and so could be used to repair damaged equipment. As the Marines broke through the encirclement and headed for evacuation along the coast, retired USMC Major Dave Vicker says, there were literally hundreds of those Tootsie Roll wrappers lining the roads out of the chosen reservoir. Retired Major Laurel Hill said in the Hanover, Pennsylvania Evening Sun in 2006, ask any man that served at Chosen to be good, a Tootsie Roll must be frozen. The Air Force did eventually figure out the code and start dropping 60 millimeter mortar ammunition. The Marines managed to break through the encirclement and make it to the coast where they could be evacuated. The survivors of the battle refer to themselves as the chosen few, and commemorations of the battle often include Tootsie Rolls, dropped from aircraft. Current U.S. military rations, called Meals Ready to Eat, still contain various candies, including Hershey bars, M&Ms, and Tootsie Rolls, among others. In an odd twist, MREs used to include a type of candy called Charms. You might recognize Charms as the maker of Charms Blow Pops. Charms candy are small square sugar candies that are fruit flavored in different colors. And during the 2001 invasion of Iraq, they developed a reputation among Marines as being cursed. According to the legend, if you eat a yellow Charms, your vehicle would break down. If you ate a green one, it would start to rain. And if you ate a red one, you would die. The only answer, according to the Marines, was to throw your charms away as far away as you could. A blog post on a website called Veterans Breakfast Club suggests that one could trace the path of the U.S. invasion by following the trail of discarded charms littering the desert. Partly because Marines refused to eat them, charms were removed from MREs in 2007. But here's the ironic twist, given that Tootsie Rolls had saved the Marines at Chosen Reservoir in 1950, because Charms Candies are made by Tootsie Roll Industries. I hope you enjoyed this episode of the History Guide, short snippets of forgotten history. And if you did enjoy, feed the algorithm by making a comment or clicking that like button. If you have suggestions for future episodes, please send those to our suggestions email box. Check out our webpage at thehistoryguide.net. And of course, we're on Facebook, Instagram, and Twitter. You can book a special message from the History Guy on Cameo and check out our merchandise at teespring.com. And if you'd like more episodes of Forgotten History, all you need to do is subscribe.